All right, I'm going to try to do a video for y'all so you can um, do this stuff at home. So this is um, NCCR level three, electrical level three. Um, the module is hazardous location. So I'm just going to do a quick and dirty run through of, of my notes and what you'll need for um, your practice tests and everything for going through this um, and all the work and stuff like that. Um, so I'm just going to run through stuff um, and not dig into it too much. Um, so I'm on page one, hazardous locations, um, trade terms, um, approved. That's going to be acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction. Remember that a authority having jurisdiction, AHJ, is your that's just your inspector that's going to inspect stuff. That's not, um, and remember for industrial settings, like you're not going to have an inspector come out and inspect stuff. Uh, you should know what conduit is, equipment, explosion proof, explo explosion proof apparatus. Those are going to be important um, for these because you're going to have to have different components that are able to be in an explosion proof uh, environments. My first highlight on page one is the on the right side of the page, paragraph first sentence. The NEC divides hazardous materials into three classes, class one, class two, and class three, with two divisions for each class, division one, division two. So you'd have class one, division one, class one, division two, so on and so forth. Uh, section 110, class one locations. Um, first sentence I've got highlighted. Class one at our class one atmospheric hazards are divided into divisions one and two, and are also into four groups A, B, C, and D. Um, so you got classes, two divisions, and then four groups. Uh, next paragraph, first sentence is highlighted. Those locations in which flammable gases or vapors may be present um, in the in the air in quantities sufficient to produce explosive or ignitable mixtures are classified as class one locations class one locations so that's the second paragraph first sentence of 110 my next highlight is in the last on the page and it's the sentence that's that starts on page one continues on the next page areas adjacent to division one locations into which gases might occasionally flow also belong in division two. Gases in which division one uh, areas adjacent to division one locations in which gases occasionally flow also belong in division two. One, two, zero on page two, first sentence is highlighted. Class two locations are those that hazardous that are hazardous because of the presence of combustible dust. Um, I've got a little arrow pointing down to my um, next highlight in that same paragraph. Um, my next highlight is the example the examples, which I think is the third sentence. Examples of these locations are working areas of grain handling and storage plants and rooms containing grinders or pulverizers. Um, so a lot of people don't think of grain silos and stuff like that as hazardous locations, but definitely are like uh, um, the dust that can be created from corn and soybeans and stuff like that is highly, highly, highly flammable. <clears throat> so like that would be a class two location. Next paragraph, I've got the first three sentences of the next paragraph highlighted. So bottom left of page two. Um, besides the two divisions, class two atmospheric hazards also cover three groups of combustible dusts, dusts, E, F, and G. The groupings are based on electrical resistivity and ignition temperature of the dust. Group E, uh, group e is typically division one. Groups F and G may be either division one or division two. Next highlight, 130, class three locations. First highlight is the first sentence on the page, longer, longer sentence. Class three locations are those areas that are hazardous because of the presence of easily ignitable fibers or other flying materials, but such materials are not likely to be in suspension 
in the air in quantities sufficient to produce ignitable mixtures. So they have the presence of easily ignitable fibers, but not enough to um, produce um, an ignitable mixture. The next highlight is the rest of the paragraph. So that last sentence that continues on to page three. Such locations usually include certain areas of uh, rayon, cotton, textile mills, clothing manufacturing plants, and woodworking plants. So those are examples of class three locations. And you can see those on, on page three in the different, um, just the pictorial of the textile mill, woodworking plant, clothing manufacturer. Um, nothing highlighted um, in 140 on page three, um, talking about the requirements for hazardous locations. Moving on to page five, or four, sorry. Uh, 141, garages and similar locations. So you gotta think about like a, um, like a garage, like a oil change place. Like this would be a, obviously a hazardous location where you're gonna have oil and, and stuff like that. Um, 141 on page four, last paragraph on the page, first two sentences are a highlight. Figure four shows a typical automotive service station where applicable NEC with applicable NEC requirements. The space in the immediate vicinity of the motor fuel dispensing island as noted is denoted as class one division one. So where you get gas is, is a class one division one uh, location. Um, in table 1B on page 5, um, I've got the um, first, in the first row so for like the hazardous area class 2, but in the groups section, um, under the class 2 division groups, I have the group F um, note highlighted. So all the way in the right hand, um, in the top right of page 5, group F. Uh, atmospheres containing combustible carbon carbon node, I don't know that word car combustible carbonaceous dusts dusts including carbon black charcoal coals or dust that have been sensitized by other materials so they present an explosion hazard. Top right of page five. Uh, next highlight on page five is in table two at the bottom. Uh, they talk about wiring methods for class one division one. So second second row is wiring methods. Um, one method for class one division one, I've got the rigid metal conduit. So using rigid metal conduit is acceptable for class one division one locations. So that's your that's your hard steel piping. Page six is more tables. Um, the only highlights I have on pages six and seven is in table four, bottom left of page six, in the um, uh, applications for class two, division one, under the row with circuit breakers, fuses, switches, and motor controls. I've got the characteristic of dust ignition proof enclosure. So if you're in a class two division one location and you have circuit breakers and stuff like that, it needs to be in a dust slash ignition proof enclosure. Nothing else on pages six and seven, flipping over to pages eight and nine. Eight and nine show the figure four from two page or three page, three or four pages ago and talk about how um, in a lot of uh, like oil change places have a service pit um, so that's important, like some gases and stuff are heavier than air and they can fall down into pits. Um, so that's why you have to watch those, those service pits and stuff like that. And they can, they can have, um, different divisions based on where you are in that garage. Nothing highlighted on, on these pages, but, um, just good to know. Uh, nothing highlighted on page nine, flipping over to page 10. Um, in this section of hospitals, 143 on page 10, um, the first full paragraph, paragraph right above the first note, first sentence is highlighted. Anesthetizing locations of hospitals are considered class one division one to a height of five feet above the floor. Anesthetizing locations of hospitals are considered class one division one um, of a, to a height of five feet above 
the floor. That's the only thing I have highlighted on 10 and 11. Um, and that's all for section one. They have petrochemical facilities um, that you can read through, but that is all I have for section one. So you'll have section one questions on page 12 to do, but I'm just going to keep going um, with this chapter on to section two. Section two, um, conduit bodies. Remember, conduit bodies are like your LB, LR, uh, LRLs. Um, LLs. So that's like the, the part that you would you would screw on to a piece of rigid metal conduit. It has, um, if you remember from last time, they have like, they say you hold it like a pistol and whatever side the opening's on is what it is. So you have like a LR would be the openings on the right, LB is opening on the back, and LL the opening would be on the left. Um, sealing compound and seal off fittings, we're gonna, that's the um, one lab for this chapter we'll, we'll be doing a ceiling fitting so um, you'll want ceiling fitting so if you had like a maybe like a gas storage room or something something that's going to have like hazardous fumes in a room and you have conduit running from that room to say there's an office next to it um, you obviously don't want those fumes going from there to the office through the conduit even through the pipes and stuff like that so you would use what's called a ceiling fitting um, and all it is 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 a, a fitting that goes in between two pieces of pipe and all you have to do is um, it's like a mortar mix that that will mix up like you mix up mortar run your wires through you open up a little uh, opening on one side pour your little mortar mix in and it fills everything up obviously once you're um, once those that mortar has set you're not pulling wires you're not pulling putting wires in there you're not pulling wires out but gases can't pass from one side to the other um, so that's that's going to be one of your um, ceiling fittings that we will we will do a makeup of in, in the lab 210 sources of ignition um, right hand side of page 13 fourth paragraph whole thing is highlighted finally many parts of the electrical system can become potential sources of ignition in the event of an insulation failure this group includes wiring key in on the on this uh, what's in parentheses particularly splices and wiring transformers impedance coils solenoids and other low impedance temperatures without making without make or break contact. So like they say splices because if you make up a bad splice, like every time you turn something on, if there's an air gap or like a little bit of air gap, you can have a little bitty spark and it's just a source of ignition. Um, the last sentence on the page, all the way at the bottom, it's gonna continue on to the next page um, is my next highlight. Volatile vapors have a natural tendency to disperse into the atmosphere and rapidly become diluted to the concentration below the lower explosion limit, particularly when the, there is natural or mechanical ventilation. So most of the time, if you have something like natural gas can fill, like wants to um, disperse itself till it's, it's non-ignitable. I'm on page 14. 220 explosion proof equipment and seals you can see a couple of the um, explosion proof like you might have like an explosion proof switch so that's where you just have like a regular switch but you got a um, a face plate that goes on the front of it that, that will make it explosion proof um, and then you have the the what's wrong with this picture um, hopefully you can look at that and, and see that if you're not using the holes in that box you have to have plugs in them or else it's not um, it's not worth anything if there's holes in the box like for um, usually if you buy a box like that um, like they come with however many plugs you need uh, make sure you put those plugs in <clears throat> 222 or 220 sorry 220 explosion proof equipment and seals first paragraph second to last sentence is highlighted equipment is rated both by classification and temperature Equipment is rated both by classification and temperature. Uh, page 15, going on to 221, uh, intrinsically safe equipment. This is my first online test question. I got a couple online test questions on this page, so make sure you mark those in your um, 
and you got them noted to study for the test. Online test question is the first sentence of 221. Intr intrinsically safe equipment is incapable of releasing sufficient electrical energy under normal or abnormal conditions to cause ignition of a specific hazard or atmospheric mis mixture in its most easily ignitable concentration. First sentence 221 is an online test question. Um, 222, explosion proof conduit and fittings. I've got the heading highlighted um, and I've got four highlights in, in 222. Explosion proof conduit and fittings. Uh, the first highlight is um, where you see NEC section 344.28. Um, I've got that sentence highlighted. NEC about, I don't know, getting close to halfway through the paragraph. NEC section 344.28 requires the taper to be three quarters of an inch taper per foot. So one in 16 taper. So that's just, that's, that's making it so the conduit can, that you have to have a certain type of taper. Paper makes, makes it easier for conduit to go together and tighter fits. Um, so it's important not to just have a straight conduit, but to have a taper so that, that you're getting the most thread engagement as possible. The immediate next sentence is a separate highlight. NEC section 500.8E1 requires conduit and fittings to be made up with five threads fully engaged. So it goes along with the last highlight. Um, but you have to have five, key in on that five, five threads fully engaged. Um, the next one is the second to last sentence in that paragraph is an online test question. Online test question, second to last sentence in that paragraph, where it becomes necessary to employ flexible connectors at motor or fixture terminals, flexible fittings approved for the particular class location shall be used. Remember whenever you hear um, the word shall, um, think of the NEC, that means you have to do it. So if, if you have to have um, explosion proof stuff for a motor, remember remember a lot, you're not, you don't usually wire a motor up with hard pipe because um, a motor will vibrate and stuff like that stuff will come loose. So usually you have what's called a whip um, and you have some type of flexible conduit going to that motor. Um, so if it's in a hazardous explosion location, um, Whatever that may be, the whip has to be rated for that location, is all that's saying. The immediate next sentence and the last sentence of 222 is a separate highlight. Unions are pro provided to facilitate the installation and removal of equipment. So a union is just made to where you can separate two pieces of pipe or something like that. 223, seals and drains. The first sentence is is, is my highlight, is a highlight. Um, first sentence, seal off fittings, also known as sealing fittings or seals, figure 10, are required in conduit systems to prevent the passage of gases, vapors, or flames from one portion of the electrical installation to another at atmospheric pressure and normal ambient temperatures. Next paragraph, um, the first that's just one sentence is highlighted. First sentence is highlighted. For class one division one locations, NEC section 50115A1 states that in each conduit run entering an enclosure for switches, circuit breakers, fuses, relays, resistors, or other apparatus that may produce arc sparks for high temperatures, seals shall be installed within 18 inches from such enclosures. That is all my highlights for page 15. Page 16, you go into, um, goes into the floor plans for, for different stuff. Page 17 shows those seal off fittings. So um, if you look on page 17, figure 8A, those are the, the fittings that we're going to use. Um, that, that, that is the fitting that you will make up in the lab um, for a seal off fitting. So you've got a little drain and a place to pour your um, mortar like mix. Um, to make your um, seal. 
page 17, the second full paragraph, the whole thing is highlighted. Second full paragraph on page 17. In humid atmospheres or wet locations where it is likely that water will gain entrance to the raceway system, the raceway should be inclined so that the water will not collect in the closures or the seals, but it will lead to low points where it may pass through integral drains. Key in on the integral drains. You gotta have drains on there so that if water gets in your conduit, it drains out and it's not sitting in the pipe. Pages 18 and 19. So still, still in the same section for seals and drains. Um, you can see some more drains um, and seals and like they have all different kind, types of, of, of drains and seals for, for conduit. Um, different pictures in figure 11 and 12. Um, but my highlight, um, no highlights on 18, page 19. I've got the um, third full pair, third paragraph. It's a sentence that splits the column. So all the way in the bottom left of 19, just that first sentence of that paragraph that goes on the top right. Uh, sealing compound is poured after the conduit system and seals are installed and the conductors and packing fiber have been installed. So that's just saying you're not going to seal them up till everything's been pulled through and everything's done. Um, page 20 and 21. First sentence on page 20 is highlighted the seal off in figure 13. So you can see like it's literally what you're going to make up in the lab um, between uh, figure 13 A, B, and C. Um, like that's pretty much exactly what you're going to do, but the highlight first sentence on the page, the seal off Figure 13B has an additional plug opening in the lower hub to facilitate packing fiber around the conductors to form a dam for the sealing cement. So you put that little cotton type stuff um, in there to create a dam, and then you just pour your mixture in so that it, it fills up and you're not just filling the whole conduit up with the mortar mix. It's, it's just that one section, but that, that, that cotton um, material just creates a dam to block to so it can, you can fill up that with that mortar mixture. So I've got for 20 and 21, 22 and 23 is just is showing different like class one division two installation, class two um, power installation on page 23, figure 16. Um, and that is all I have for this chapter. Um, so got about 23 minutes. Um, so just make sure to do the review questions uh, you got section one and section two reviews to do. Um, page 25, you got 10 questions for module review. You got the section review on page 26. Um, and then you also have the practice test. Please let me know if you have any questions or anything like that.